Alright. What's up, everybody? This is Dominic D'Angelo of SEScoops.com at freeshows.com. It is one of a kind with RVD. And we're live on RVD's YouTube channel with guess who? RVD. Rob, how are you, dude? Excellent, dude. Van Tastic. Great to hear. And it's super nice in Las Vegas and super horrible in Pittsburgh. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> That's, yeah, 75. I'll be wiping sweat off my forehead um, as we as we pod today. Hey, there we go. Well, guys, we uh, yeah, we're live. So if you want to get a question in here, feel free to uh, use the super chat. If you definitely want your question answered, I'll always keep looking at the chat here. Uh, we have a couple already already in the in the queue. So we'll be queuing those up here pretty quick. But uh, yeah, Rob, how was how's the week been? How's everything been so far? Um. It's been, uh, it's been good. It's been really busy, dude. Um, juggling a lot of, a lot of things, um, as far as filling up my calendar with, uh, bookings and things of that nature. Also, um, also working on a couple of things that, uh, um, that could be really big and, uh, yeah. And, um, so I'm excited as always. I remain optimistic because uh, life is awesome, and uh, I'm, I'm always excited uh, that, that that tomorrow I'm going to be more grown than I am today, and I'm always right about that. So uh, everything is damn fine. <laughs> damn fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, Andrew Reed, thank you for the ten dollars. He does ask if you felt damn fine about winning. How did you feel when you won the TNA World Championship? It's a huge accomplishment to you like the TV and WWE title was. You don't talk about beating AJ Styles too much. Rob, what were your thoughts on winning the TNA World title? Yeah, um, it was, well, it was, it was awesome um, because at that time, TNA was being talked at as another option an alternative place to work that could possibly um you know um take care of you so that you're making a, a comparable amount of money or whatever people were throwing numbers around kurt angles already down there you know and uh, so i wanted wwe that um before would have felt stuck started saying hey you know screw this i don't have to be here you know i'll just go to tna and uh that kind of became a bit of the mindset not that they would take everybody but for a minute there it, it almost did seem like they were taking uh anybody and um so w when i got there it was because you know i had a um a good uh a good deal that was worth it and so it was after being in wwe for so long a uh and swimming in a new pond and and i felt you know like my career my name my efforts everything that i have done earned me some leverage at least in the uh, boss's eyes um at the time it was uh, eric bischoff and hogan and um you know that that made me feel like they were really behind me i I uh, won two matches that night because it was like a tournament. So I wrestled Jeff Hardy, beat him. And, you know, I know he's like one of the most over baby faces there. And then wrestled AJ Styles, beat him. And so I thought that's a really good way to be uh, presented um, if you want to be, you know, over. And uh, pretty good push, you know, um, unlike my very first night in, when I uh, got um, death by a thousand uh, baseball bat stings. And um, that was something people always remember as being kind of weird, but not too long into it, boom, I captured the TNA heavyweight championship. And so I felt like, uh, uh, cool, you know, like maybe, I mean, a lot more here in this pond than I did in the other one. I don't know, um, but, uh, you know, also, one thing I remember about it is that uh, Eric Bischoff didn't seem too impressed with AJ. I remember before going out there, I just remember um, 
Eric saying, you know, I would just boom, like make it really short and quick. Bam, five star frog splash in the middle of the ring. And it sounded like he was just wanting me to, to squash the dude, which of course I didn't want to do. Mm-hmm. It was very talented. And uh, we had a lot of matches together, which were uh, really good. A lot of them that were on the road and not on TV. And, um, you know, unfortunately, my back was hurt for um, almost my entire TNA run. So <clears throat> matches like that might not have lived up to AJ's uh, fantasies watching me thinking, you know, or when he was coming up in the business, being inspired by RVD was, let's just go ahead and, and, and say, we know that he was, everybody was. And so, um, you know, there's a few times like that. Same with um, Teddy Hart. When I wrestled Teddy Hart in a single match one time, like I felt like, like I I was hurt, you know, and, and, um, you know, I'm not known to have crappy matches. And so of course it wasn't, but I think in his mind, just like with AJ's, they're probably thinking like a fantasy match. Like, Whoa, if I had RVD in the ring, man, we would have a six star match. And, and they, you know, and they're thinking, you know, that, but really, I mean, I'm not part of the new age. Let's take a thousand pile drivers and stand up for a sidekick and stand up, you know, for a DDT anyway. And, um, and that's a lot of what the new guys are doing. So I don't know in that way that it would have uh, matched up anyway, but could have uh, definitely had more memorable standout-ish matches um, had our had we both been uh, healthy at the, at the at the same time. So that's what I think about when I think about um, being a TNA uh, heavyweight champion. And I remember, you know, they would do meet and greets every night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in the ring, you know, uh, I would have the belt. Um, and always, of course, put it on the shoulder of the fans or whatever. But every night, every night. So a lot of fans have pictures with them holding or wearing the TNA Heavyweight Championship. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. I remember, like, yeah, they would come to house shows and do, like, live, like, yeah, shows and stuff like that. I, I went to the one in Johnstown and stuff. And that, that was always a big aspect of it. Oh, go and meet somebody in the ring, like, for get a photo op or whatever. But uh, to your point, yeah, you winning that title, when I watched it, I remember feeling like, man, this is further validating TNA, like, moving forward, because you got, like, you're still, like, in your prime, and you're still, like, a champion that can really carry, uh, help carry a company and stuff like that. So it felt like a really, really great time to, like, tune into TNA and see all that stuff happening and a lot of, like, promise and stuff, but... And like, yeah, just the younger talent that was there at the time, like Samoa Joe or AJ Styles or you kind of name it. It was like a good blend of veterans and the younger guys that you wanted to see kind of further develop and stuff like that. And AJ's yeah. still doing it at a high level, too, which is pretty cool. They were they had just started going live, I think, shortly before I got hired on and they were uh, trying to compete, you know, with the live wrestling show. I think they started on Monday night and then moved to a different night, if I remember right. Um, and so they were really, really trying to do something, you know, so I felt, um, good that I, that they saw me as being an, an important, um, weight in that scenario. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, it was pretty cool. It was like, it was a letdown ultimately because it seemed like their money wasn't focused on the right thing sometimes where they would go to these live shows, but they weren't really well promoted. It seemed like that a lot of the times it was just kind of like an afterthought in certain ways and. Uh, it, I think it was a big expense for them a lot of the times to kind of do that too. So, um, but yeah, it was, I, I really enjoyed that title run for sure. It really kind of added a new level, I would say to TNA at the time. Um, cool. Well, what else, uh, I wanted to kind of mention too was, uh, we, I forgot to do this last week was, uh, this day in history kind of thing. And this one's a pretty significant one. Uh, 25 years ago was living dangerously uh, where you took on Jerry Lynn and um, it was, let me pull up the, the details of the match here, but um, it was a, uh, let's see. Yes. Rob Van Dam defeated Jerry Lynn uh, living dangerously from the convention center in Asbury park, New Jersey to retain the ECW world television championship. Originally Lynn had the match and the title won via referee's decision after the time limit expired. But Lynn asked for five more minutes overtime to determine a clear winner, and it did not go in his favor. 
Do you remember that, uh, any memories of that match, what, Rob? Um, not specifically. You know, I just remember it was in a continuous line of me progressively enjoying working with Jerry more and more and feeling like like we were bettering ourselves and bettering the match every time just based on the competitive spirit that, that we both had. And I, I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously that's such a great rivalry, historic rivalry in wrestling and in ECW. Is there another like kind of rivalry that didn't involve you, but was an ECW that really stood out to you as like, man, that's a real highlight kind of, match and and uh yeah rivalry for for what ecw was well, for, for the rivalry you know i think of um maybe like uh raven and tommy dreamer yeah yeah mm-hmm. that was something that i mean me and sabu might have just dipped in and out you know maybe but that was for the most part that whole storyline was like a whole something a different part of the show and so i wasn't paying that much attention but when then when i would look at it you know then they're talking about who you know who's the daddy of the baby or or abortions or, or stuff. i was like whoa what yeah. and i was saying that the fans were really into it too so i was like okay um i'm learning what ecw is all about and that takes me way back to then yeah yeah um since wrestlemania is in philly and stuff like that and it's kind of we're getting closer and stuff like that do you feel is there kind of like a cool excitement like oh it's gonna be a neat kind of atmosphere being there and like is it kind of reality almost kind of setting in or are you kind of just used to ah it's just another appearance and it'll be cool to be a part of all this experience how are you feeling about wrestlemania moving up here with philly it's gonna be a really busy week you know and uh it keeps getting busier i just had to add a day onto my week last night Ooh. and if you go to robvandam.com i got all my appearances up there and uh, I will continue to do that as I get posters and stuff. I have dates, you know, for the end of the year that I haven't put on just because I don't have posters yet. And then maybe or maybe not, I'll just put the towns so people can. But I don't want people to start asking, hey, well, where in Atlantic City are you coming? When are you going to be? You know, it's because uh, I don't know that stuff e- either. You know, I just know that I'm booked. But um <clears throat> Philly's awesome. That's my hometown, one of them, you know, so I'm looking forward to being there. Um, it's been, somebody reached out, mm-hmm. asked if I was interested in doing uh, the uh, Marlino podcast. Oh, nice. That'd be awesome. But he does it in Florida, but I guess he goes back and forth sometimes. So I don't know if they meant that week uh, necessarily. I thought they did. But I got to go back and read the the details uh, to see if if it you know if it, if it says that. But but anyway, um, as of now, besides being a WrestleCon every morning from ten o'clock until two in the afternoon every day, then um, let's see Thursday I have the match at the ECW arena. I'm wrestling Speedball Mike Bailey. Yeah. Yep. Friday is um, the Black Party at the ECW Arena. Um, maybe Hall of Fame, too. I don't know. Saturday, I am doing a dispensary, uh, a, a uh, an appearance at Indigo Dispensary in uh, New Jersey. I think it's Brooklawn is the name of the town. Um, and um, Sunday, I have a watch-along where I'm watching some of the pay-per-view i guess with some people and uh and and i'm trying to squeeze in a whole bunch of stuff uh, around all of that so it's going to be a really busy busy week oh how about that yeah i'm looking right now rob <laughs> yeah you got you got a stacked deck uh the block party meet and greet is friday april 5th 4 p.m to 7 p.m at the ecw arena the battleground championship wrestling presents that so block party meet and greet and then yeah your match against speedball mike bailey uh, is the Mark Hitchcock Memorial Super Show April 4th at 7 p.m. So, guys, if you're in the Philly area, definitely look into getting a hold of some tickets and, and seeing Rob and having a good old time. It's gonna be That's going to be a heck of a match, you and Mike Bailey, I tell you what. That's what um, they say. Yeah, it's going to be – I so I saw him wrestle Dax Harwood, uh, Wrestlecade at Wrestlecade a couple years back, and it was – they went 
30 minutes and it was an intense tense fight very different from what you usually see so i i can only imagine what you two are going to do it's going to be good stuff man um, i'm feeling good you know i was thinking it, it, it it's funny because it sounds cliche you know when people say i'm in the best condition of my life the best shape of my life but a lot of people would say you know looking at me like oh you know, he 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 is in the best condition of his life <laughs> respectively i am because i ain't never had veins popping out like they do now and uh and just overall you know had this uh this physique that i see right now and um uh for you know a lot of reasons but but, but, I, but i'm comfortable i'm feeling good and um so because of that you know i'm going with the flow i'm uh, taking matches i have uh, a few other ones um besides that one that aren't that week but also that week i do have business meetings and and stuff and uh we're going to be launching something really soon in the way of uh, glass and paraphernalia and RVD. Ooh. Yep. So I might introduce you to some uh, partners there um, when I see you at WrestleCon or yeah. throughout the week. Yeah. That'll be great stuff, man. <laughs> yeah. No doubt about it. Um, what else did I want to ask you about here? We had a... Oh, We've talked about John Lerner and I just before. I was going to save this for a little later on, but uh, apparently he waived his right to uh, get uh, served papers. So, in so what that means, in like uh, according to PWI Insider or Pro Wrestling Insider, that means he's just going to he has to respond by uh, after sixty days of March fifteenth about like what he's going to do in court and stuff like that when it comes to all the Vince McMahon things. So, um, so in other words. In other words, instead of receiving the papers, um, he hasn't received them. And so it's going to time out to where he has to respond or they could rule against him. Right. So here, uh, this is what I'll pull up the quote here. It says, former WWE exec John Laronitis filed a waiver of service yesterday before the United States. A District waiver Court. of service. A waiver of service before the United States District oh. Court of Connecticut. He said, it says, basically, Laronitis has informed the court that he is aware of the lawsuit Janelle Grant, uh, the alleged victim, had filed against him and others. He is waiving that he needs to be served with the lawsuit personally and has attested that he will res he will respond within 60 days of uh, March 15th. So he's already six days in here there before he needs the response. So um, some interesting developments there, I guess. But, yeah, it's just a wild situation that curious what more will come out about it and uh you know hopefully everything gets uh leveled out here because it's just nuts man <laughs> i've never heard of that a waiver of service i thought you just had to not answer the door you know and and or just not yeah that's what i thought too like just because you always see in the movies like somebody will be like hey you got papers and then they're like run away right yeah <laughs> well I, i've been there have you oh yeah that's right he's oh man oh <laughs> Uh, we do have a super chat here. Thank you, Digital Architect 999. He says, What's up, Rob and Dom? Hope you're all doing great. My question is, What was Vince's reaction to you smoking weed? I'm grateful he didn't give you a cheesy stoner character like he did Riddle. <laughs> what was his reaction? Because, yeah, Vince is always like, Oh, I'm about the body and all that kind of stuff and has his own mindset about things. Hmm. I'm trying to think if I ever had the conversation and I don't think I've ever talked to him ever about smoking. Yeah. No, not that I can remember one, one time I brought it up. Um, but then I shut the window on it immediately. And this is, uh, this is part of a much bigger story. Uh, but it was at a point where I was uh, adapting to the the new waters of WWE, the political atmosphere, people stooging on me for smoking. Um, it ended up, Johnny Ace said uh, one time, he said, hey, Robbie, um, you know, Vince is going to want to talk to you on Monday. Uh, somebody, 
somebody said that you're smoking weed during uh, TV days. I'm not saying you are. You probably are, but I'm not saying that. But, um, and, and, you know, he's going to want to talk to you about that. And I was like, I had so much on my mind that I needed to get off. So I was like, man, I can't wait to talk to him, you know. And 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 so much, man, that's weird. I, I guess Barbie would be re- reacting if that was a car. I thought I heard a car. Oh, really? <clears throat> Must not have. Barbie's ears. Are, Barbie's ears are better than mine. Uh, anyway, when I got to TV, and I and I had a feeling like I don't think Vince is going to want to talk to me about that. You know, I mean, if I'm in his position, uh, I have so many layers to protect me from having to do certain things, and one of those things would be having to know publicly no like having to admit that he knows you know like for him in his position he'd be better off if if he if he didn't ever have to know for sure that rvd smokes weed and if i have that conversation with him and i'm like yeah yeah i smoke boom 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 well i think that would put him in a position because now he's got information that could you know potentially come back as libelous to him and that's that's just how I've always felt about it. He's not going to want to, he's not going to want to talk to me and not want to confront that at all. But I was so frustrated that I made sure he confronted me. (laughs) We had the talk anyway, and I waited outside his door and, uh, and I had something else going on. I kept going back and forth and kept going back to the door and waiting and waiting and waiting uh, from the room. He was in and Michael Hayes said, uh, finally like, uh, Rob, did you want to talk to Vince? (laughs) I was like, uh, yeah, I do. That would be great. He goes, well, let me go in there and, and, and see if he can talk to you. He went in, came out, said, go ahead. And I went in there and I had a lot of stuff that I was frustrated on. So I like let it off my chest is what I did. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I brushed that and then just went right by it. You know, I said, hey, you know, Johnny told me that uh, that you were going to want to talk to me because somebody said uh, that I'm smoking weed and getting high during TVs. And he went, <clears throat> um, actually, Rob. Uh, and then I just went, I just, you know, raked his eyes and just got <laughs> right over it and said, you know, that's so typical that, that somebody would be stooging me off try, because they can't handle the fact that I'm getting over here doing it my way and, and a legitimate tough guy. So the APA can't go out there and just power bomb them. Like it looked like they were doing as a shoot at that time. I don't know if they were or not, but I know that was on my mind. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's just a little piece uh, of a much bigger story. And, that's the only time I think I remember ever, ever even having pot in the conversation with Vince. Yeah, yeah, man, yes, that, that kind of aspect of. I bet that had to feel good though. Whenever you had those opportunities to be like, "This is I got a lot of shit that I want to say and <laughs> get off my chest." When it comes to that stuff, it wasn't often two or maybe three times while I was there, and they were all pretty pivotal in my stress levels. Yeah. I could imagine that. I could definitely imagine that. Yeah. And when you don't get those opportunities and you want to say something, you have a niche to say something, it's just like, oh, I'm a good way to talk to him. And, and, you know, yeah. You know, some other issues I had to take care of that day, too. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, man. Uh, Seth chimes in. Thanks for the 20 bucks, Seth. He says, I want to shout out Katie for showing my love to music on Instagram. I got a new one out called Find Out RVD Question. Your gimmick and real life personality seem like one and the same. Do you act any differently at all when you're on, when you're on camera in comparison to, you know, just being RVD off camera? Right. Well, it's a little different. My, and thank you for the donation and fix that fucking song, dude. Um, YouTube Chris said he didn't get a link. Didn't he, did you say you sent a link though? No, no. I think what you need to do. Uh, Seth told me, me that we need to, uh, he, what he has to do is he has dispute, to, we need to dispute the copyright claim. Dispute the claim and then he'll get a notification on his end. Seth will, and he'll, he can refute the claim and then clear it off for us. I think, but we that. have to first dispute, enter there a dispute. There has to be something where you have to like appeal it or something like that on, on the channel. I think. Got you probably where on the, probably on the email that said we're flagged or whatever. 
yeah maybe something like that or sometimes too i know in the youtube studio they'll be like hey there's like a little yellow notification or something typically that'll you got to click on and go through the process of doing that so it might be something that effect seth can even probably give us more details i'd imagine too so nice so um you know i would put it this way my morals my values my priorities are different when i'm the character rvd you know i want to kick ass uh, i'm going to accept a challenge you know i'm uh i'm a ego centric you know like showing off uh and i would say that all of that is a side of me but normally i don't act that way i it's not those things aren't important to me uh showing off having everyone's attention in the room when i'm not working and i don't have it turned on and it's turned off um i and if i'm not doing a podcast or or answering a question or in the state of mind of thinking this person actually wants to hear what i have to say then i really don't talk very much i'm um silent uh, a lot of the times and you know katie will check on me sometimes just to make sure i'm not in a, in a bad mood or whatever just a happy little love you baby love you baby you know and i i stay in my head a lot and and i think a lot and um <clears throat> that's different because RVD, you know, in the in the ring is the whole effing show. There's not that much difference because the I wouldn't say the 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 personality isn't that much different. Just that I think I'm a lot more of an inner where when I turn it on, boom, now it's about bam, being an outer. <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's the best uh, way that I think I can explain it. And by the way, I, I've I've talked about this so many times i don't want to tell the whole story but you know wwe used to always want to make me angry make me angry but mm -hmm. i don't get angry angry is a is a, a boom i've lost the battle if i get angry i've lost the battle within myself you know what i mean i can't let emotions take over that's not cool and i wouldn't want kids watching me to to take after that i'd want them to know how i really feel about anger they thought the money was in anger and they and johnny would suggest some things, you know, th there was a point with Jerry Lawler where he would just get angry and he would just, boom, he'd take off like that one strap. And then you knew it was on, you know, like he was not playing games. And, you know, maybe like, I don't know if it's throw the ponytail out, it's probably not that, but something like if you could find something and, you know, and they always wanted to push my buttons, push my buttons. I've told this story so many times, but I'll, I'll see if I can say it real quick and, uh, you know, one breath here, but one day I'm working with Chris Jericho and all day long, they're on me. Remember anger, anger, you know, anger. Think of something that makes you mad, get angry. I'm like, okay, fuck off, I can do it. And they're on Chris all day. See if you can make him angry, you know, like when you're out there, like try and like really poke him. Like we wanna get get this out of him. Like no one's seen an angry RVD and they thought that's where the money is, you know? And I was like, dude, I, I, I'll act like I'm angry. Shut the fuck up. And, and I was getting really pissed because they kept on all day trying to make me piss and then uh, right before i go out there uh you know chris is out there um in in in, in gorilla not out there yet but on his way out he says um he says you know remember be angry i said duh oh, oh what was it angry or happy duh i forgot you know and he's like um not really but i'm thinking that like yeah um anger yeah i, I i'll remember and he said you know just act like i hit on um bitch face he said her that he said the name thou shall not be spoken out of my mouth my evil <laughs> and, he said, and he said just act like i hit on her and i just thought that was like so unnecessary and i was already um simmering simmering ready to boil and uh man he's out there doing a promo or something i i ran out there bam bam i was so pissed i'm just punching him in the face Bam, he goes down, I jump up, do the frog splash, boom, I grab. He was a, the heavyweight champion at the time, and I was. Um, they wanted me to cover him and do my own count um, after the frog splash, and I was too pissed. I forgot to even count, you know. I just fucking, bam, I hit him with a splash, sit up. I think I just, you know, I like dropped the belt on him or whatever, and, and I left, and, and I was in such a rotten mood 
I did not tell this story in one breath at all. <laughs> That's all right. It's almost over. Um, it's a good story, though. I was so pissed. Yeah, I had to leave in my gear, not even get dressed in the, in the locker room. I just was, I, I was so frustrated. I fucking left, got in my car, drove in my RVD gear um, to, to, to the hotel. And it was like um, the next morning is some time before I finally uh, was able to find my balance again. I don't, I don't have a wide range of emotion. It's not easy for me to change from first gear to fifth gear and back down again, like a lot of people do. And so that's another reason that I hate and Katie hates <laughs> if I ever do get mad because it takes forever. It seems like for me to uh, calm down again. Yeah. That's a, and I, the money definitely wasn't in an angry RVD. I don't think because you already showed like intensity in the ring. Like they wanted, they wanted an angry RVD and a talking Sabu. Yeah, no, like no, because even last week, that's what we talked about was a talking Sabu, and Sabu's era of mystery was cool because he didn't talk. I think so. That's what was cool. That was what was cool, and it was cool that you were cool. Like it wasn't like you getting mad was. Everybody gets mad. Like you see, everybody else get mad in the ring, and the straps go down or whatever, and there's. That's what made you different about it. Dude, that, you just made me think about this uh, horrible day for me um, when Kane had me tied up and set me on fire after he had his mask off. And, oh, my God, I could not reach Bruce Pritchard's standards of – being scared and in fear like they wanted me to scream like i'm a fucking scream princess in a horror movie i, I don't know but when i kept being like you know stop it what are you doing whatever i was doing they just kept oh, no cut it's the shits oh, god you know we need you like like you're about to die he's gonna <laughs> He's got, you know, and I'm just like, yeah, I, I get it. I'm trying. But anyway, that was such a horrible day. Uh, people probably remember the, the the version of it that finally came out. But, man, I felt insulted. I was like, you know, like, you're act He goes, Rob, you, you're you acting. Well, it's the shits. You know, and I, and I, I always think about that, you know, like uh, I remember him saying that. And they, they talked to him on his podcast about it. Mm -hmm. um matter of fact youtube chris fucking uh it, that's where i met him he fucking he asked he had all these questions for me to prepare for the for the, for the bruce pritchard conrad rvd 420 episode it was like really long um and, and that's why the first time i listened to the show anyway they asked him about it about him uh because about me saying this they said, Rob said that you said, Rob, you're acting well, it's the shits, you know, any comments? And he said, well, it, it was the shits. The, the, the thing that he said, the, the, uh, the fucking, uh, the whole thing, whatever he called it. I, what, what was it? Uh, Pre-tape. The pre-tape was the shits. The, you know, the, the acting was the shits. The, the vibe, the whole thing, the whole thing was the shits. And I just, you know, thought it was fun. It's funny now. I just laughed it off. But yeah, not one of my favorite memories, though. What is, I don't know, like putting people, lighting somebody on fire. <laughs> it's just like. What's the proper way to respond to that? Yeah, exactly. And do plus, better. Do do it again, but just just do better than you're doing now. <laughs> Fuck. And plus you're like a wrestler. Like there's that attitude of like, hey, you got to keep credibility and all that stuff. And like, it's like, all right, I'm on fire, but like, I'm also a wrestler and I want to be pissed or whatever. <laughs> it's just like, I don't know. Kane was awesome. Uh, great dude. I liked tagging with him. It was a lot of fun. But that time, during that whole time when he turned on me, took his mask off and stuff, uh, for me, I just felt like a, like a whipping boy or, you know, like a, like food. Let me put it that way. Like, I didn't feel like they were doing much with, uh, with me and uh, Rob Van Dam's direction in the company at that point because I – wrestled him all over in steel cage matches on the loop everywhere every night i don't think my win-loss record was too good <laughs> yeah yeah that's uh 
Oh, man. Because it was cool. Like, I do enjoy odd couple tag teams when it comes to that stuff. So, like, you and Kane together was cool. And, like, they had the what, – what's the other one Kane did? Oh, with X-Pac and stuff was neat. It's just, like – but pairing guys up that don't match up with personalities and stuff like that, I always kind of think that's a pretty fun route to take sometimes. But, yeah. yeah. Lighting on fire is another story, though. <laughs> <laughs> um there's a couple interesting non-super chats we had i wanted to ask about to you somebody oh this is a cool one here jeremy shaw he says who else remembers seeing rvd live beat regal for the intercontinental title at wrestlemania 18 my brother and i marked so hard my dad had no choice but to get in on it mm. how about that so, what were your memories of that wrestlemania 18 being in toronto and all that kind of aspect well i always liked going to toronto um and you know so that that was cool that was the first time for me being in front of a crowd that big working i mean i was at wrestlemania 3 in the crowd but uh so many people it was awesome um my memory is that i didn't think that the people liked my match that i had with william regal because I couldn't hear the people reacting mm-hmm. and it probably sounds funny because it was 73,000 people or whatever, but in a building that big, the acoustics are weird and the, the sound just went straight up and it didn't make it to the ring. And I was really bummed. I thought, you know, it was going good or whatever, but I, I was like, man, I don't, what's, what's with these people? Why are they so hard? And uh, I was, I was really disappointed in it and I was, when I, I remember when I went back, you know, I was going to ask, you know, like, you know, what what was wrong? And, and then everybody was like, great match, great job. And I was like, I'm so confused. <laughs> Did uh, anybody explain that to you later on? Because that would have threw me off, too, I think. Like, especially it's like a dome. And I'm like, oh, inside? That means you're, you're going to hear a whole lot of people because it's a, in a dome and stuff. But no, it's like, they, yeah, right. The sound goes up and everything like that. When did you kind of realize, like, oh, it was just how the acoustics were in that arena? He, I don't know. Somebody probably told me that. You know, I can't really remember, but somebody in Gorilla must have heard me say that. I couldn't hear them. It sounded quiet. And they must have said, you know, that's because the sound goes up. I, I, I don't know. I almost want to say it was Eddie. Like I can imagine him being in gorilla, uh, but it's it's weird because uh, you know it's it didn't stand out for me to 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 remember that. So I don't know, but yeah, yeah, somebody must have explained it right then, I, I guess. And then later on, I would come to expect it in uh, in big buildings when the ceiling is four miles up. Right. Were Were there any nerves being in that kind of big environment for you like going into like such a huge venue being at wrestlemania and stuff like that or was it just like hey it's a crowd i know what i'm doing i'm confident my abilities and all that kind of thing oh there's always nerves there's always uh for me it's being so hard on myself i just don't want to fuck up right And, and 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 i don't want to blow up you know that's like the worst feeling when you're when you're winded um and sometimes like even if you're doing a lot of cardio and and you're in great condition sometimes just the couple days of travel that it took to get there uh time change uh or you could have like a cold or or whatever there's so many things uh that could affect your respiratory um performance that night And, and for me that's always on my mind i'm warming up uh, cause I hate being out there when I can't breathe because I feel, uh, well, it's how it sucks. You know, it just sucks. You can't, because you need, you need oxygen for energy to be able to move. And, and besides that, I remember like, um, when, like in Japan, when I learned that I also felt, you know, too vulnerable, like these guys could beat the shit out of me right now. And I'd have to say, hold on, I need a minute or roll under the ring. That's what it felt like sometimes. So I've always um that's always been important to me is to at least uh do everything i can to condition myself and then before the match i i I like to to really warm up i don't warm up as much as i used to like for instance if i used to do 10 of these kicks 10 of these kicks now i might do two or three of this two or three of that um but i stretch my lungs also that's a big that's a big thing And really like, a, you know, like using your, your, 
your position of you know what you can to, to be able to expand your your ribs more if you can take some weight off of your chest with your with your arms and like really get really really get it in there and then let it out like really slowly man that helps me so much when i'm out there trying to breathe and i think about it like uh well you got your lungs are full of these little balloons your avioli ravioli and mm. Yeah. And then, um, you know, you think about it, like if it, like a balloon, if, if you've already, if you've already blown it up a few times, it's likely going to be ready to, to blow up again and be stretched out as opposed to one that's brand new and cold and maybe not quite as flexible. And uh, it might be harder to, 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 to push air into that. And um, so that's something that's, that's always been important to me as well. But um Anyway, um, there's always nerves. There's always performance anxieties. For me, it's like I don't want to blow up. And, you know, I want everything to go the way I want it to go, the way it went up in, in, here in my mind. I visualize. I got to go out there and, like, boom, pull it off. And I always put pressure on myself. I, it, sometimes if it's someone I'm working that, for whatever reason, I just feel, like, really comfortable with, then uh, the other night in Chillicothe when I wrestled Matt Riddle, mm -hmm. uh, this match is on the uh, YouTube right now because I is saw it. it. So, yeah, um, I watched part of it. Um, but uh, the crowd was great. But uh, I just remember, and I hadn't even wrestled Matt Riddle before, but I just remember walking out there and I even asked the fan, you know, I'm high fiving him. And I, and I stopped and I, because I'm always talking shit, you know, I yeah. stopped and I said, Does everybody feel as comfortable as I do right now? I felt like oddly, like serene, comfortable, like um, different than being at WrestleMania 18 in front of 73,000 people. Yeah. Usually, um, you know, I'm, I am, uh, I do have that, uh, that, um, uh, that pressure on me. Um, but, you know, it, it does vary some. The obvious answer is fuck yeah, there was a lot of fucking nerves for WrestleMania 18. Anytime live TV, you know, makes it more than not live TV when you do a lot of those um, TV versus non-TV house shows will affect, you know, the range of nerves. Um, but usually if you're bringing RVD in, it's going to be one of your bigger shows um, unless you're just, you know, um, spend happy <laughs> and uh, don't care, you know, about bringing it back in. Yeah, that's it. How was it working with William Regal? Did you like working with him? Yeah, I I always had a lot of respect for him, and uh, and 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 considered him like a more of a of a teacher, I think, than than, than a peer, because he he had me doing stuff that I normally wouldn't do. It seemed like we worked half the match from a, a, a an overhead top wrist lock in in. And I, I don't know if it was this match, um, but it was around that. No, this was way back in WCW. Oh. The night, the night I worked him second match in uh, Northern Georgia. And then I left and a snowstorm hit and everyone else got stuck there for days. And that was, I worked uh, in my mind anyway. Worked, yeah, I know I did. I worked William Regal and I just remember like he, uh, he had me in a top wrist lock. And like he was able to to teach me and coach me through uh, like a match that made I was looking so good like you know jumping up and doing head scissors, but he pushed me off, you know, and I try again. Boom, maybe I would kick him or something, and this time maybe I would take him down. I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was still while we're in the top wrist lock, going up into and working like up here instead of working on the mat. It seemed like we kept going up to that, and I was like, wow, like. I appreciate this guy's uh, England perspective or whatever it is, but I always respected him. And a lot of people don't know this, but when I got hired with WCW, it was, it was the same day as Max Payne and William Regal had shown up to give Max a ride because they roomed together mm -hmm. with, Chris, with Chris Benoit. And, um, and I, ended up being William Regal's road partner for a while. Like he would, he would rent the car. And when I was doing the house shows in, in, in WCW, like he and I uh, rode in the car for, for a while. So. Wow. 
Yeah. I mean, that's like something that, uh, when that happens, you know, like there's so many people you can put on that list of people that, that you rode with. Um, especially if it's just two, two people in a car, you know? Yeah. So some of your notable road partners, Sabu, Booker T, William Regal, Mike Austin, well, right? That's it. That's, that's basically it. Sean Stasiak. Sean Stasiak too. Okay. Okay. And, yeah. And when in WCW, I was only there like five months. I don't remember how long, I rode with him. It seems like a, a lot, but I do also remember riding with uh, T Cold Scorpio and uh, the Cole twins, at least on one loop. And uh, Bill Dundee was with us and he was the agent. Scorpio was driving and twisting up a joint at the same time. Yeah. And I was like, are you smoking in front of him? And uh, I was—I wanted to smoke so bad, but I, I was afraid to um, smoke with the agent sitting right there. You know, <laughs> and this is '93. I just turned 22, so I'm a baby. Just a couple weeks ago, this is. And anyway, um, I remember Bill Dundee, uh, Erno Scorpio said, "Hey, I can handle it, man. I back, I back it up in the ring." And I was like, "Do you?" <laughs> mind if i if i smoke and bill dundee was like um as long as you don't uh as long as you can handle it kid don't get fucked up in the ring uh, you know and or something like yeah some don't get don't um as long as you can handle it um and uh don't fuck up in the ring and he was saying it like a warning and shit you know and as i was smoking it's going oh shit this kid's getting fucked up you know and i was like <laughs> whatever dude i'm smoking i don't i'm gonna let him talk shit <laughs> 93 just just barely 90 1993 wow yeah. rob when did you start smoking actually um it was the uh, my 21st birthday and we did a wrestling show in jamaica mm -hmm. and uh, the weed was plentiful and i wasn't into it and all the other guys were so happy because they had handfuls of it I remember on the way to the airport at the end of the tour, they were throwing it out the window of the back of the bus on the way to the airport because they just had so much and they didn't know what to do with it. Um, but during that trip, uh, I gave in to peer pressure from uh, Jiggle Jimmy Backlund, also known as Jimmy Del Rey. Um, we were all in a cabana and um, he, you know, was, hit it, you fucking prima donna. Hit it. It's not going to kill you. We all hit it. Fucking hit it. Would you quit being such a fucking pussy and hit it? It was like one of those deals where I didn't want, want to, but you know, I'm, I'm 20 years old. Just, just right, turn, you're trying to make a name. And I just turn and, yeah, I was there. Like I said, that was, I, I turned 21 right, right on that, on that trip. Uh, so that was December 18th of uh, 91. And, you know, that was, yeah, that was a long time ago. <laughs> but anyway, that's that's when I started, you know, and I didn't like it. If I hit it like twice and I didn't like it, but shortly afterwards I started smoking uh, with one of the bouncers at the country bar that I was bouncing at. And uh, I, pretty soon it started being, uh, you know, like every night I would smoke with him after, the, after work. And I'd be like, oh, my God, I smoked like, five days in a row, I'm turning into a fucking pothead. Whoa, is this okay? You know, but, but I also wouldn't have tried it except I had noticed that a lot of my heroes and people that seem to be in great shape and condition uh, seemed to enjoy smoking it and not th and think that it wasn't that bad. I didn't know what I would learn from studying about all the reasons for prohibition and all the BS, but but I did know that, and that was enough for me to be like, well, you know, th this guy and this guy and this guy smoke, trying to break into their world, you know, and and uh, you know, be cool and 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 have a wrestling career, and um, I don't know, maybe I could try it, especially since they're forcing it down my throat. <laughs> did you have? Do you remember what your initial thoughts were about weed, like when you were first starting? Like when somebody was offering you something like that and peer pressuring you into it, were you like, "Oh man, it's bad. I don't know about yeah. it." Like, uh, oh yeah, Sabu, Sabu used to think it was funny to roll the windows up when he'd be smoking with Judge Dredd. Yeah. Me and Dango would be in the back seat, you know, knock it off. Hey, come on. 
<laughs> yeah. um, but I was taught in high school that it's a dangerous, hallucinogenic, and it was a very, very troublesome uh, problem in our society, uh, along with LSD and uh, PCP, that we watched these movies that scared the hell out of us, <laughs> people on PCP, and that was what was going to happen if I smoked weed, so... I was definitely against it, you know, and after at the bar, you know, I, after smoking every day with with Barry uh, every night that after a while, then I guess, you know, I started uh, in, enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. I, I was like when you mentioned that, like you were 22 and I was like, wait, when did he start smoking? I'm like 21. 21. OK. Yeah. But when you were uh, when you were with uh what's his name uh phil dundee and stuff in the car you were oh. really yeah oh yeah yeah um yeah that was a year was... that was about eight, 14 months later than yeah. uh, after i started how was it being a bouncer um it was cool i mean you know that was the wrestler job especially down there in florida a lot of them are male strippers almost all of them bounce you know i i was making a whopping 35 dollars a week at the uh sportatorium to wrestle so couldn't go very far with that money and you know one of the, the strip clubs um would pay 50 bucks a, a shift that uh, some of my friends worked at um i think i got six dollars an hour it seems like maybe for at the uh the wild west and um it was it was it was interesting because one it was a country bar and I had never been exposed. I was so young, you know, like sure. right out of the womb, basically, is how I look back at it. But uh, I had never seen cowboys in real life. You know what I mean? And, I, and, and so, like, when I saw all of them, and they're all dancing to the boot scoot and boogie, <laughs> and, and they all got hats on, the cowboy boots, and I'm looking at them, and in my mind, and this is probably how people see wrestlers, but in my mind, I thought that was going to be them 24, 7 hours a day. And I'm like, how come I've never seen – these people, like, do they only come out at night or are they, are they working on the ranch in the daytime, you know, like rattling up, hustling up their cattle? And, and I really, I really thought that. And it, it took me the longest time till I realized like regular, normal people with normal jobs, uh, some of them listen to country music and then <laughs> and some of them like to, you know, put on some cowboy boots when they, when they go out. And, it, and uh, I, I didn't know that. I really thought it was like a different species of people or something. Just like I used to with wrestlers before someone said I could be a wrestler. I was like, what? That can happen. <laughs> what? Yeah. You can do that? Yeah. Uh, but it was a rough bar. And so there was a lot of fights and, you know, looking back at it, um, you know, I, I was a bit of an asshole, because we wanted an image and we wanted the people to be scared of us, scared to start a fight in there. And we were trying to get our reputation out like the, the, the Dallas bull, which was the number one country bar at the time um, in the area. Uh, they, that was a bigger, um, you know, busier, hotter chicks place. And uh, they, they had, big badass bouncers that had a reputation for beating the shit out of people. So we were going after that, looking back at it, you know, not cool. <laughs> not cool. Yeah. Yeah. I might've hurt some people, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Did you have a dress code? Was there a dress um, code? Uh, well, here's the funny thing about that since you bring it up, I, I, I we did, I don't know what it was. Um, I can't remember what the code was, but I stood out like a fucking, like a Martian in there. Did you? Yeah, I would wear um, these. Uh, it's 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 a uh, it's made you know like a from the like a, the cotton I guess of a, a like sweatpants kind of you yeah. know. But it, it was it's weightlifting wear is what it is. You know, like big a, a shirt and, and the shorts that are you know like down to your knees cut yeah. off. And um, and the shirt with a logo of you know someone lifting or, or whatever, and um, they matched. They were the exact same color, and I'd be in there with lime, like bright ass neon green. Yeah. Or I wore pink, <laughs> <laughs> and 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 it was dark in there, and everybody's you know got the hats and boots, and I I, I must have looked like um, I was on fire, probably. You know. <laughs> That's yeah. 
really, yeah, really was not my world. And I was, you know, not trying to adapt. And, you know, me not trying to conform. That's it. That's it. Did you ever read the book? Uh, he has a series of books. Paul Lazenby, he's like the stunt man. He was also like, I think he did a little MMA stuff. But it's uh, When We Were Bouncers. And it has all these stories from wrestlers and MMA fighters about when they were bouncers and stuff like that. And, uh, uh, no, I haven't heard about that. But I mean, if anybody's really interested, one of my RVDology episodes, I I tell a story about what was they said the second biggest fight that they'd had at Wild West. Um, <clears throat> and I started it. <laughs> oh, you really? <laughs> yeah. Well, I made the call. But anyway, um, what what is that? It's what what was my subject of that? Um, mm, damn, I can't remember. But I think maybe it has Wild West in the thumbnail, but I can't remember actually which archaeology that is. But YouTube Chris, you should know. Anyway, um, yeah, there's a story there that I'm not going to tell right now. Okay. <laughs> no, I see you. Hey, getting back to the lungs thing, I wanted to ask you too. Uh, do you find that is the most important part of before getting ready, whether it's your lifting weights or working out or wrestling, like kind of getting in touch with your breathing a lot of the time? Is, is that always a big aspect of you getting ready for whatever you do physically? Um, no, 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 just, just mostly with, with wrestling. Okay. Okay. I mean, or swimming, you know, if I'm swimming underwater, but it's, you know, I don't do that a lot, but that's actually where I learned. I used to do that when I was a kid, that, that breathing exercise, do it a few times, stretch the lungs out and then get a really, really deep one to hold it and swim the length of the pool and hit the wall and swim all the way back and do it underwater. And, you know, I guess, yeah, like I said, <laughs> some of the personality of RVD the wrestler is I have those in me. A lot of that was like when I was a kid. I was a show off when I was a kid and I was always, yeah. But so anyway, um, Mr. Morris taught the class that in, uh, in sixth grade, taught the class that breathing exercise. And I just never forgot it. It made sense to me. And I've always done it, you know, um, since then, since sixth grade and just... Sometimes, like, I got to, like, move my body or jump up and down a little bit to get to get even more in because yeah. expand it so that my ribs are, are, are like, really um, maxed out. And anyway, he was telling us about people that lived high on the mountains that could hold their breath for several minutes. And it was uh, because of their big ass lungs and their body had to develop because there's not as much oxygen up there. And, you know, that's why I do my cardio in the, in the sauna or, or one of the reasons is there's not much air in there. It's not easy to breathe. And I force my body to, to, to have to adapt to that so that if I'm in the ring, it's hopefully much more comfortable. Even if I'm in, in a hot, humid uh, city or, or state, it's still not going to be like the sauna. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, cause it's like something I need to focus more on. I know is breathing like in, in, in certain aspects like that. And uh, yeah, before working out or anything like that, I'm not a good swimmer, so <laughs> I can doggy paddle. That's it. <laughs> All right. Uh, something else I wanted to kind of touch upon too. Um, I wanted to get, if you ever had this kind of feeling, cause this is a different one that like, L.A. Knight was interviewed uh, on Busted Open, speaking of Bully Ray, and he was asked a question from Bully Ray about um, if he was pushed too quickly and if there was a concern for that. So he says, there's so many different ways to look at that. When he said Bully Ray's assessment that maybe Knight is sick and tired of being put on the back burner and not getting a push he deserves. He's like, maybe there was a little too far of a push, a little too fast, and that's not to look a gift horse in the mouth, but a little bit of a steady build going into a championship match or something like that. As far as going into the U S championship or the Intercontinental championship or something like that, but just jumping straight into the WWE championship back at crown jewel, where he faced Roman Reigns. He was like, that was a little fast where I almost was. Worried. What are we talking about? I'll tell you about my Bubba. Dudley. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. We're talking about LA Knight. So LA Knight, yeah. Bubba Ray Dudley asked him about, uh, if he got pushed too soon, too fast? If he thought he was getting put on the back burner. And then, so L.A. Knight's starting to explain that he's uh was concerned about maybe he was being pushed too quickly 
when it comes to uh, Crown Jewel, like because he was in the main event with Roman Reigns for the world title at Crown Jewel in Saudi Arabia. And so like, and he's relatively like started getting his popularity last year. And so he said, jumping straight into the WWE Championship back at Crown Jewel was a little too fast where he almost was worried it might make people go, ah, they're not going to do this. They're not going to shove them down our throats like this, are they? Because there is that potential at the same time right now. I think I'm in a damn good spot. I don't know if I'm selling myself short so much as i'm just being cautiously optimistic so rob was there ever a concern like you were like oh man they're gonna they're shoving me down the throats or anything like that or you're just riding that momentum and just know that you're able to capable of handling a situation like that um i'm not really sure i understand the question but i'll just take your words literally okay because i was actually resending Renee, the, uh, the, the link, the link? You know, <laughs> okay. my attention was divided there, but if you're asking, if you're asking if I ever felt like I was shoved down people's throat, you know, that the, um, schedule was monotonous, ridiculous. I felt like so busy, you know, I was, I seemed to hate it more than everyone else, which must be because I left mm-hmm. and the other guys, even the ones that talked about it, that acted like they hated it as much as me are still there, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. not, no offense, Booker T. No, but some of them not, <laughs> um, but you know, some, some big show, um, there was a bunch of the guys that was, Oh man, I'm going to take a break or, or whatever. Then I was like, Oh, I wasn't just talking. I mean, I'm, I, I have to disconnect and, and, and I did have to, but I felt a lot during that time, like, why do I have to be on every single TV? Like, why, you know, why do I have to be on every Monday uh, Raw, every SmackDown Tuesday, every pay-per-view? And, you know, now it sounds like what a what a thing to complain about because, of course, you want to be used and you want to be over and you want to, you know, work the most, make the most money and all that. Of course, it's, it's a, you know, ooh, I got too much work. That's... You know, it, yeah, it's a hell of a thing to complain about. But just to answer this question, I did feel like, you know, what if I was off, you know, like uh, like one Monday or something like how, you know, would that kill what you're doing with RVD? Is that going to kill my momentum? And and, and I, I remember I did feel like that. I thought that uh, that, that, that it, the schedule was unnecessary, mm-hmm. I thought. But I also wouldn't have thought that three hours of wrestling would have been uh, a good move because back then we were doing two hours and I thought two hours felt like a lot, you know, so I would have been like, no, I don't think, I don't think we need three hours. I think that's going to be way too much. And obviously it must be a successful venture because they're still doing it. So, you know, what do I know? Yeah, no, it's crazy too because you mentioned it too a couple of weeks ago. Shad Gaspard told you it's always like when you're in the W Ecoscape that it's you're always constantly running a race and it's just like you're always trying to get ahead and there's that's never right. always going to be getting ahead of basically in it. And I think that's yeah, it's crazy. always yeah, never <laughs> ending. Running that race, man. Running that race. Uh, Ms. Khan also gives a different perspective on that too, in regards to you. He says it's not comparable because RVD was already over it as fuck. An established guy when he got pushed quickly after joining WD. Yeah. So LA Knight's kind of making his hay right now and being pushed in that element. But it's uh yeah, it's a, it's an interesting perspective for sure. So hmm. uh, but yeah, so I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Um let me see. Can I answer the question? Sure. Let's see here what we got. Um I know oh, I started one. Guys, if you have a super chat question, be sure to chime in and stuff. I'll try to Figure out. Oh, I did want to bring this stuff up. Some reaction to your Matt Riddle match. A lot of people already watched. Apparently, uh, yeah, I figured it had. I can't remember fifty six thousand views. Wow, I gotta like. go look at. I'm gonna go watch it after we're done here. Uh, was just watching RVD and Matt Riddle. Rob is truly the best pure all around athlete in the business. How about that? Thank you very much for that. Yeah. And, uh, digital so, architect. someday they're gonna figure it out man <laughs> digital architect chimed in too he said you and riddle had a lot of chemistry and uh L-I-O. Yeah. yep that did is you feel all- that too in the ring when you were working with him like you guys like vibe really well everything uh yes and like i like i said a few minutes ago i felt like incredibly calm 
just walking out to that match. Like um, it felt m more like, I don't know, like it felt like there wasn't much pressure. It felt more like, it, it maybe it's because a lot of it might've been because it's a, a house show and, and chill a coffee, uh, you know, and, and, and not the whole world isn't watching. Although, you know, everything lives on YouTube, but I was, but that was probably a factor um, as opposed to like, live tv where there's a lot of pressure but also just just because of matt just being around him too it was just like i just felt like really comfortable and i felt more like you know whatever happens happens and you know there was I, there wasn't anything you know like crazy going oh i hope i don't fuck up you know because it was just we're gonna go out there and wrestle and and you know you know what am i gonna do you know so um i just felt really uh really comfortable and and uh, and it, it pretty much stayed that way, uh, being, you know, like after, you know, walking to the ring, but then also uh, getting in, in the ring and um, and having the match and stuff. I enjoyed it. It was fun. Yeah, I just saw Matt Riddle in a match a couple of weeks ago. He fought in MLW against a guy, uh, Bad Dude Tito. And hard-hitting, quick match, but it was so fun. Like, it was just look legitimate. The, everything was, like, crisp and smooth and everything like that. And like it's like I was thinking too, it's like, you know, he's got the MMA background and everything like that. So there's like legitimacy there. But yep. like do you find that too a lot of the times when you work with somebody that has a uh a combat sports kind of background, whether it's MMA or something else, uh, does that do you find help a lot working with somebody like that? I think so, yeah. I I, I do. Um, assuming that they can also pro wrestle. Sure, yeah. yeah. Um Yes, a lot of times it's it's I um you know I could be judging like some indie dude that in his mind he's like this you know this big star and that's just because he fantasizes about that watching wrestling on TV so somebody that actually went and did it you know and was in there you know uh, with MMA where you re really risk a lot, you know, and, and someone that, that has, that has what it takes to, to, to go through something like, uh, UFC matches. That's some, it's, it, there's like an automatic respect there, um, for me that I feel. And, um, and, and it does make things easier. Yeah. yeah. Took out more in common, I guess, maybe also than, than someone that, uh, I don't want to say he doesn't feel worthy, but, it, but I mean, over the years, I'm thinking, you know, sometimes I'm in the, uh, I'm, I'm meeting somebody, you know, cause somebody had enough money to bring me over to wherever across the pond. And then I'm working on somebody, you know, that, that wants to have the, you know, a match with me, like they are Jerry Lynn or like they're, you know, like their uh, cane or whatever, whatever the deal is. I've always not liked that about pro wrestling, how, how, how even the playing field has to be in order to tell a story that's not four seconds long. Mm -hmm. um, but um, within, within that, that world, um, it seems sometimes even worse when I'm talking to a kid that hasn't been anywhere and couldn't possibly interest any other promoter but himself. And he wants to do the Van Damme later on me, <laughs> you know what I mean? Stuff like that. Yeah. It's just, uh, yeah. But anyway, you know, I, I do everything by my own standards now and everything's awesome, but I'm just thinking, you know, of without, with my experience, you know, throughout, yeah, I definitely rather have a guy that's uh, that has what it takes to challenge himself and and has proven himself and and you know there's a lot of value in that. What value do I put in you just because you put me versus you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Do you get that sometimes? So like legitimately, like younger guys will be like, "Hey, can I do your move on to you?" <laughs> yes, that's wild. <laughs> yes uh, that's called not reading the room <laughs> um unsweet tease thanks for the five dollars he said wrong side of town is one of my 
mine and my friend's classics. A lot of good shit in there for good and bad reasons, he says. Any good <laughs> memories of making it, Rob? Yes. Yeah, a lot of good memories. Some not so good. Uh, if you look me up, I've done a lot of movies. I don't, I don't know how many. I don't know. I don't even know where you draw the line because documentaries i can be in one of those and not even know i'm in it because i just did an interview you know so right but as far as acting goes um quite a bit and and wrong side of town is my only starring role thus far that i've had um and uh unfortunately it was just a little before it was when i was still green you know before i really learned uh that I qualify to to commit, you know, and 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 that's a lot of what life is, and about and when you know it takes experience sometimes to to change your perspective. But anyway, and what I'm saying is, you know, not super proud of the acting in it, but um, it, you know, it's a B action movie. had had a lot of fun with it. One of my funnest memories is. Uh, there's a scene where I'm, let me see, am I being, I'm being chased, right? There's a bounty on my head and uh, everyone's coming after me to get paid. And anyway, I'm going, I'm going to run. There's a, there's a parking lot where, um, I, I'm going to run down the steps and then I'm chased. Mm -hmm. And, um, that was awesome because, I mean, I was, you know, they, I don't think that they captured how much of the athleticism was real that I was doing. So, it, you know, it'd be like stairs and then turn left and uh, and left again, you know, to do 180 stairs, 180 stairs, you know, from a high building. And when they would say action, I'd go so fast that the camera couldn't catch me. It kept telling yeah. me to slow down. But I would go two steps and then jump about eight. And I just had this rhythm that I would go whew, boom, boom, whew, boom, boom, whew, boom, 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 boom. And it was so fun. And every time I did it, they, you know, I was ahead of the camera, but um, they, uh, I had so much fun with that. And another one, they, they took me to this parking lot and, uh, and they said, you know, we want you to, to, to run and then somehow get up to that uh, ladder. There was a, like a fire escape ladder hanging down this building, but it only went down to the, I guess third or second floor, second floor. It didn't go all the way down to the ground. And so there, so I, I, you know, I just looked at it right away and I could, boom, I visualized, you know, my path and they started talking about, we're thinking, you know, maybe we can put some steps on the wall and hide them so you don't see them. And, I, and while he's talking, I'm trying to shut him up. And I'm like, hey, get out of the way, get out of the way, get out of the way, get out of the way. You know, and they're like, oh, what? I said, out of my way. Let me show you something. And I ran and I jumped up on the dumpster that was already there and then jumped off the dumpster and then grabbed the ladder and went boom, 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 and climbed up the ladder. And um, that was probably the most fun I think that I had on set. Like, I really enjoyed uh, that stuff. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, you know Hey, can you pause this for a second? I got a delivery at the door. Absolutely. I'll plug uh I'll plug Get Blitz in the meantime. How's that sound? Okay, perfect. Yeah. So hey guys, yes, uh, as always, RVD, one of a kind with RVD is sponsored by Get Blitzed. Get Blitzed Lit Aid is nano infused THC syrup and is a hundred percent legal in all 50 states. As a matter of fact. You can uh, get, yeah, you can get it in bundles. You can get it in several different flavors. Uh, Blue Raz, I just got Blue Raz. I'm going to try it when I'm around people because I'm a novice when it comes to THC stuff. So I want to make sure I'm around the appropriate people when I do take it. But uh, yes, I uh, Mickey Ray Sinatra and Courtney, they're based out of Maryland. So they have some stuff in Maryland. But yes, if you go to get-blitz.com, Use promo code RVD. You can get 15% off your order, 15% off. And I tell you what, I, I, it's gotten high praise from guys like Kevin Nash. He tells everybody about it. I know he gets the key lime pie a lot. Um, but, yeah, they're really cool bottles, and you get a lot. I, the bottle I, I just have, it's like a it's a huge amount, and like it can take, like I think, at least like 35 doses. And especially for me, it's going to take me a lot longer than that. Let me tell you that much. But, yes, go to get 
dashblitz.com. Get dashblitz.com. Get dashblitz.com. Use promo code RVD. Get 15% off. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see that QR code right there. Give that a scan. Check it out. Uh, couldn't ask for a better product. Really cool presentation and everything like that, too. But, yeah, get blitz.com. Get dashblitz.com. Promo code RVD. Flavors like blue raspberry, pina colada, uh, cherry, uh, tiger's blood, and a couple other more, too. So definitely check that out one more time. It's get-blitz.com. Promo code RVD, 15% off. So check it out, guys. Check it out. And as usual, too, we're also sponsored by Blue Chew. Blue Chew. You can try it for free. Use promo code RVD, and you get $5. All you got to pay is $5 for shipping for BlueChew.com. Uh, yeah, head to BlueChew.com. Use promo code RVD, and heck, you check it out. Chew it and do it, baby. BlueChew.com. All right. Hey, so there we go. Blue, Blue Chew is good because, like, you know, you never know when you're in a threesome and, and you can't keep it up after the first 30, 45 minutes. Right. <laughs> so then to get there you go see <laughs> that's how it goes there <laughs> all right we had some uh good uh other questions here too my delivery this is uh oh part of it and so Ooh, all right what's the what is it uh what's the name of it i don't know i don't even care you don't care <laughs> it just doesn't matter <laughs> Yeah. No. Uh, Jay First Furcat Jay Furcat asks if you have any good Maven stories. YouTube sensation Maven now. Man, I wish I did. Uh, the, you, he was around when I first came into WWE in two thousand one, mm -hmm. and um, you know he was he seemed to be like uh, the kind of guy that everyone got along with. A good sport joked around a lot um with everybody uh the only thing i remember is that he was instrumental in turning me on to nair it was him and stevie richards <laughs> stevie, stevie was the first one and then uh um and then maven backed them up because i was shaving that was something i just decided to do i was curious about shaving um because you know i was reading because you know your, your muscles will show more whatever and, and i was hairy in ecw i always had hair and so coming to wwe i thought well that'd be a good time to switch it i can always remember it by that timeline like i was hairy till i went to wwe started shaving i sucked at it took forever and i would gaff that i would have big white uh, big chunks uh, missing out of my body with white flesh where the blood doesn't blood doesn't even come for a few seconds because it's so deep that your body can't believe you just did that right uh, and leaving patches everywhere and uh, stevie was talking to me about nair you know about how he uses that and how it's so easy and and i just remember maven being around during uh during the during that time you know and saying uh telling me oh yeah you know just you know don't you know you can't put it in a certain spot where it'll burn or whatever his input was and i remember kane uh during that time when i was just new at nairing saying something just trying to make a joke or whatever when he was he kept coming into i was in the shower like in the daytime nearing and he was like um is that good that my partner's rubbing cream all over his body and he was just you know trying to make a joke and um and uh that's it those three guys i remember like i'm gonna always associate them with me starting to nair good call of faction uh like the near 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 gang <laughs> in about 2001, if me and kane were partners though huh that was yeah. like three but whatever however it worked out however it worked out there <laughs> <laughs> yeah well uh here's an interesting question uh this might be uh so he's got a two-parter here memphis mark cool. asks any good stories about the tennessee territory and then he adds and if you were suggesting something natural for parkinson's what would it be weed wise smoking well uh weed wise so they're just asking if i would recommend a particular strain and i think you know just gotta see no no i don't i wouldn't recommend a certain strain uh although i would just like you know anything like that i would say you're gonna want a strong indica 
maybe OG Kush if you really don't have anywhere to start and and uh, for something like that. And um, I have a very good friend who has Parkinson's who tells me that um, he gets amazing benefits uh, from weed, which I've turned him on to, and I'm glad I did. And, um, you know, starting with the CBD and um, and then with full on marijuana and said, you know, you might not need the THC, the CBD might, you know, be all you need. And he prefers the, 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 the THC and something to do with it, relaxing the, tempta- the temptation to shake, I guess, a little bit or something like that. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, that's awesome. All right, good to know. Uh, do you have any good stories about Tennessee, the Tennessee Territory, Memphis? Uh, um, yeah, yeah, actually, uh, that was, for me, um, the, the first time that I got to go uh, on, on the road and be in a territory where we're in the same town weekly over and over again in, in, in several towns. So uh, they had a loop back then. And, and for me, this is 91. And they had, I'm 20 years old, not even old enough to drink yet. So excited to be on the road. And it was like, um, let's see, Saturday morning, you did TV in, at the Memphis TV station, Channel 5, I believe it is. And then uh, uh, Saturday night, it was in Nashville at the fairgrounds. And then Sunday would be a spot show. They were doing Jonesboro, Arkansas up until when I got there for some reason like that week. Um, Oh, no, I did do Jonesboro, Arkansas. They were doing the Dallas run to do ESPN, and they just lost that or stopped doing it. Global Wrestling took over when we first saw Jerry Lynn and X-Pac. Yeah. Workers Bagwell. Yeah, that way back then. Um, Anyway. Uh, Monday night would be Memphis. Tuesday night would be Louisville. Wednesday night would be Evansville, Indiana. And it was cool because up to that point, I was a brand new guy everywhere I'd been. No, you know, I had introduced myself. Nobody knew who I was. And, and now I got to see what it's like to come back to a town that's already seen me wrestle, already knows who I am. And man, that was so cool um, because I had a great match last time. I'm gonna have another great match, and and you know, obviously, that's how you build your star powers by continuing to build that that momentum and 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 get the uh, the fans built up behind you. So that was awesome. I learned to do merchandise there. I learned that um, I could, if I sold pictures, I could pretty much double my payoff. And there was a guy that would uh, take pictures of you at the arena and then next week when you come back he would have proofs to show you and you would pick out like that one and that one and then the next week um he would have those pictures for you which you could buy from him maybe he charged a dollar and we could sell them for five dollars i think i think and they were like three by fives and you know if i was getting paid 25 bucks i could sell five pictures and now i just doubled my payday and I was the only one that could do that out of our group because I was a baby face and the heels weren't allowed to sell. <laughs> I also wasn't allowed to associate with the heels. And that was something that Jerry Jarrett yelled at me for. Um, and I knew about k because, of course, she is super old school. But here we are, um, the only people that know each other, green is grass from Michigan, and we're sharing a car together. So we did end up uh, exposing the business a bit which wasn't cool. We'd get seen sometimes at restaurants and people would, you know, what are you doing with those assholes, man? And, you know, well, the only ride I could get, you know, fuck them, man. I'll give you a ride. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Yeah. But um, also that's where I met uh, Chris Candido and Tammy. Uh, My first Saturday night in Nashville, we had a match against each other mm-hmm. and they thought it would be entertaining the boys like dirty white boy uh tony anthony and uh tom pritchard was he there uh, dr tom pritchard was there um and um whoever was in charge it was there's was eric Ambry, bill dundee mike danny davis those guys. And they thought it would be funny to, because 
I, I was so young and green and, and talking a big game, I guess. Put me and, and Candido in there and uh, have us go the whole time limit. Whoa. Yeah. They thought it would be funny and they'd be laughing and it would suck. I stink up the place. Um, that The term for that that they used to use in the business was Broadway. And Sabu always thinks it's hilarious to tell the story that they told me I was going Broadway. And he says, Rob, well, who, who we thought he was, that meant they was making it big time and going to New York, New York city or, you know, Broadway. And uh, anyway, we had a great match. That's awesome. According to, according to said veteran wrestlers that were, it was a sellout at the curtain and uh, Tony Anthony and uh, Pritchard, and, you know, they, they told me afterwards, that yeah, you guys were like, wow, you guys are doing all these high spots and stuff. And, and and especially they thought it would suck because we couldn't get together uh before the match. The heels and the faces were on opposite sides of this big ass building they used for the flea market. And so at best you might get a message across or you know, maybe run outside and try and you know meet without fans seeing you good luck but it was something where you know we had that we were pretty much uh for a lot of it just meeting in the ring and and working and um and so there's one of my memories from the tennessee territories that's a great one man and two it's kind of fitting because today would have been uh chris candido's 54 52nd birthday so you know i love synchronicity how about that awesome yeah dude yeah pretty awesome uh also pretty awesome uh <laughs> seth gave a great faction name for the uh the nair people the nair do wells <laughs> so there we go <laughs> okay. you're talking about rv bro <laughs> no not R- yeah. rv bro that's yeah you get they gotta make that happen i think <laughs> <laughs> Um, Seth also did uh, a two dollar one, so thanks, Seth. He says, "Who else can do a gorilla press moonsault combo? Who else? Do Have you seen anybody else do that? A gorilla press moonsault combo, Rob?" I don't know if I have or not. If I have, if I have, then I think it was either Kenny Omega or or Will Osprey, which you know it would be in there with someone i guess smaller than him but i don't really know if i i've seen them one or both of them do the moonsault into the front handspring into the uh you know like into the corner and i'm not sure if they did the gorilla press leading into it or not yeah yeah no that's a that's always a cool spot and we were talking last week about- oh i did it in uh, black mask too by the way did you yeah because there was a fight scene and I leg sweep the guy and I flipped back. No, I didn't do gorilla press and my leg slipped him and he went down. But I did the standing moonsault on him, boom, front uh, handspring flip under my feet, fight the next guy because it was, it was a group fight situation. And and, and the uh, fight coordinator, you know, was open to ideas and stuff. So that's that's one thing that I that I got in. Just a little trivial, little trivial uh, pursuit information for you. And I had to do it with a bunch of wardrobe, wearing a cape, this ridiculous big mushroom head that was glued to my head that kept going off every time we would shoot it. And uh, and, and that was very challenging. But I, I thought, hey, man, I think that's why I got the job. I yeah. want to show what I got. Heck, yeah. Uh, DeMarty DeMarl says Liger used to do it, Justin Thunder Liger used to do it. So, oh, the, the whole okay, the gorilla yeah. press and the, 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 the moonsault thing. Um, have yeah, you I saw him before I did it? I really don't remember, yeah, I made up that or saw someone do it. I don't know. Have you happened to catch any of uh Osprey's work on the mic these past couple weeks on Dynamite? He's been he's been really good, like. He's really like I mean obviously I knew he was so talented in the ring and stuff like that but he's been really good on the mic and stuff like that. It's almost like some classic kind of wrestling promos in a lot of ways in his own cool. Yeah, pretty neat, man. Pretty neat. Well, Rob, I I we, I covered all the notes that we had outside of what we, we might have had for our guest. Do you want to Yeah, he flaked on us. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. So, uh do you have any uh do you have an RVDology or anything you want to do or 
Mm, well, I guess uh, maybe I could try to chat a little bit. Don't really have anything uh, prepared, but I'm trying to think of something we could leave the the people with. And um, I made a uh, I use this just as a point um, recently, but I was talking about something else. But now I just want to elaborate on saying that as long as you're doing your best, um, you know, you should, I think you, you deserve giving yourself a break. We talked about that because somebody asked, how do you make yourself do things when you don't have to? Mm-hmm. And uh, that guy, you know, his question is, is, is stuck with me because that's, you know, a struggle I can relate to. Um, but we, we, we attacked that, you know, we, we talked about how, priorities change um a lot of times they change just just because of where you're at because of when when it is whatever you know sometimes like right now it's more important that i do this or this but you know later on or tomorrow whatever um something else might be more important or it might be a pressing issue or in front of me or have to do this before i can do that whatever but it's okay that that the stuff changes all that time i um always go with the flow and think that things will work themselves out, happen when they're supposed to. That's how I find balance. But there are things that I sometimes wish I would put more time and energy into and and wish that they would be on my front plate and more important than other things. But you know what? If they're not, they're not. And and that's where I find my inner peace, which um, – could be taken from from other people as um, excuses. Uh, hey, if if working on myself in that area was more important, then I would do it. You know, um, you, um, <clears throat> what what we said was as long as you're doing your best, then, uh, bro, that's all you can do, and that doesn't mean you know, giving everything that you do a hundred percent, you don't have to be that interested in everything. You know what I mean? Like whatever you could be asked to uh, help somebody carry something. You don't have to do your very absolute best. And, and it, like you're going for a job and, you know, watch out, everybody watch out. I, I got a parcel coming through. I'm, you know, for an example, yeah. uh, if you're, if you're, if you, I dabble, I dabble in things and a lot of the things I dabble in don't end up being winners, you know? And because of that, you could never say that I've got the Midas touch. You can never say that everything I touch, you know, just turns to gold and, 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 and that my name has like a, a, a um, unconditional value, whatever I attach it to. That's not true. That's not true. It has some value perspectively, but a lot of things I'm not afraid to dabble. And like I've said before, I'm a sucker for a good idea. Um, but I, I try not to get L's and I try to get all W's. Um, I feel like I am juggling like so much. And the point that I'm trying to make is everybody does. Everyone's busy with, with, with a lot of things. And whether it's professional or whether it's, you know, watching the kids and you got to pick up this one at, at their school and the, oh the dogs got to go to the vet. It could be like just family stuff, household stuff could be anything, anything, but w- we all have a lot that we're doing and um, you got to take it in its totality to say, you know what, I, I, I'm considering all of that. You know, I, I think I'm doing the best that I could um, to to do all that and still have time for this, have time for them, or you know, or still have time for whatever. You got to look at it like um, it, if you're doing your best, you just can't do any better, you know. And that works with everything. And it's so easy to accept that and then just be able to blow things off. You know, you're a kid and uh, other kids want to laugh at you. Ha ha, you got really big ears. We're going to call you Dumbo. You know what? Ha ha, that's hilarious. Can you do anything about it? 
No. So why even let it bother you? Are you gonna what are you are you gonna hide you're gonna wear a hat, hide your ear if you be feel insecure? You know what? You're doing the best that you can. That's that's you. If they can't handle it, fuck them. Um, that's what I'm talking about. And, and that's like, you can use it for little things like, you know, there's nothing more I can do about that. I'll be honest with you. I have some uh, friends, really distant friends, some that I don't even like that much or whatever, that I have um, thought before that they were really depressed and I felt like, you know, I, I feel like I did everything I could to tell them to turn around, snap out of it, whatever. And if they, if they, if they don't and something happens, I'm, I'm not going to say, oh, I could have done more, should have done more because given everything that's going on and how much and where they are in my life and all this, I did the best I could. That is a great feeling. It's a rewarding feeling. That's a cold kind of example, I guess, to use. But I'm just trying to um, cut through my babbling and, and use examples that maybe people can understand. Overall, if I put a lot more into doing this, it might throw me off balance. It might, you know, make me a lot more stressed and then it's not worth it. Guess what? Big picture. If you find a way that you think overall you could do better then cool, work towards it. And that's called growth. And, and we're all doing it. Hopefully, I'm growing all the time. And so that is finding a way of actually being better, living better by my own standards. So um, I give you permission to look at how you're doing with everything, with problems, with rewards, with family, with business, with enemies with love with hate just overall you know look at it and if you're like man you're doing what you can congratulations good on you keep doing it what more could someone ask that's it man that's a, that's a great one and you know like i think too always kind of be cognizant of when you're being negative on yourself too as a person if that's when it's going on like thinking big picture and thinking like doing your best you can but and thinking of all the responsibilities you might have don't be like oh i'm just i'm such a lazy asshole or i'm not doing this right or i should be doing this a little bit better or putting more focus on that try to think in the positive aspects of how you've been doing and what you've been doing with it too i think that's that kind of helps you get that thing going and, and realizing that you are putting some effort into it and stuff like that ultimately so good job. I give you a pat on your back. Yeah. All right. And you said, somebody already said, Wyant, he says, ah, you know, I, I kind of needed that to hear that one. This awesome. Time. So that's, hear. He, I love hearing that. That's, that's an energy lifter. That's what I, that's, you know, what increases my spiritual frequency. So I appreciate that. That's why I'm doing it, bro. The coloring contest has really taken off for the Is it Nice. Oh. Heck yeah. So many submissions already. I'm, I'm starting to think, wow, it goes on till 420. Maybe that's too long because I don't know um, how many we'll get. And, and and I don't know, like some people, I, someone said, hey, can you let me know? Someone let me know that you got it when they submitted it. And I'm like, I don't know if we have that. I got to talk to my webmaster uh or, but you know, it sounds like a good idea. I'd want to know also, mm -hmm. you know, I want to know if I if they at least got my entry into the contest. Otherwise, I got no chance. So, <laughs> but I don't, but there's already like so many and it's only been a week. A week started this. Yeah. Yeah. How about that? Yeah, guys. So if you are interested, it's RVD Wrestling Gear Coloring Contest. Download the images, go to rvrobvandam.com, color them, send your finished artwork to RVD ebay at gmail.com due by april 20th uh joe holland uh rvd's airbrush artist will help us select the winner airbrush the actual real life outfit and rob will wear it on tv a really really cool idea and it's already looks like a neat design just uh uncolored too so you guys fill in the blanks there oh the ones i've seen look really cool too like i'm looking forward to seeing that actually painted um, yeah yeah Oh, man. Yeah, you'll have to send me some. I want to take a look at some of them and see what they look like, too. That would be awesome. Uh, but, yeah, guys. So, yes, go to the email again is rvdebay at gmail.com and submit it. Go to robvandam.com. You can download the template there and color color away, guys. So, make make it happen. Cool. Very cool idea. So, I bet. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm just reading. Someone said uh, Scott Steiner uh, might have done the Gorilla Press uh, into a moon. So I can see that. I don't know. A young yeah. one, he yeah, he might have done it. Or they said he would at least been capable of it. I think for sure that man. He would back. He would drop kick someone and do a backflip off of that. You know. Yeah. It was, and it was the first one that any of us, at least that didn't watch international wrestling ever saw the uh, Hurricane Rana. Rana which, yeah, and I oh, I always uh, called it the Frankensteiner at first because I never oh, heard the Hurricane Rana. I, yeah, I, I still do. Why? Sometimes the Frankenstoner because it's funner. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> <laughs> hey. I guess um, I should do that and call it the Frankenstoner, you know? Yeah, see, that'd be, <laughs> that would be a good one. <laughs> yeah, I might have to put. I gotta put a little twist on it. If yeah, I'm you do. You do. Uh yeah. I'm thinking something that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. If someone could think of a way to do it different, it'd be this guy. That's it, man. Seth chimed in one more time. He said, "Man, I pushed myself so hard. I needed this RVDology." <laughs> Dude, that's awesome. And here I was thinking, do I want to do one or not? And I'm glad that I made the yeah, right the choice. Already- I knew I was plugged in uh, to the universe when uh, we got the synchronicity because, uh, you know, what are chances that I'm going to bring up um, Chris Candido and then, bam, I had no idea that was, <laughs> oops, that was his birthday. So that's uh, that's awesome. I love yeah. that. I love life. I love the universe. It's a great, it's a great time, man. It's a great time. WrestleMania weekend will be a lot of fun, guys. If you're in Philly, be sure to go say hi to Rob. Check out all the events. Go to robvandam.com. Take a look there. If you guys like what you're seeing, go to rvdtv.com. Also, go to Rob's YouTube channel. If you like to listen, go to Spotify. Go to iTunes. Leave us a five-star review for a five-star frog splash. Help us out. Follow Rob on social media at The Real RVD. You can follow me on Twitter at Dominic D'Angelo. And, guys, what a fun episode, Rob. This was a good coverage. I had a good time. And uh, we all learned a lot. Yeah. Um this weekend, I am in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, a lot of people, I guess, if not everybody, I guess, well, I guess we'll hear this afterwards, but I'm still confused about that. You know that. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, the 23rd, 23rd, I'm in uh, Massachusetts, in Springfield at a big convention. I'll see a lot of my friends there. Heck you know? yeah, I see on the poster, there's Matt Riddle, there's uh, Bischoff, there's uh, Enzo Amore, Sabu. Will be there. Uh, Elias, too, I also see. And so, yeah, check that out if you guys hear this beforehand, which you can hear earlier on Premier Streaming Network. And what about the people that are with us right now? Don't right they here, care? Right work? now, you guys are here. Uh, duh. Yes. So, yes. valid info, valid info. See you in Springfield, Massachusetts. All right, guys. And heck, we'll see you next week here on One of a Kind with RVD. Cool. Thanks, Tom.